In the late 50s, Sam Cooke had hit after hit on Tiny Keen Records, but his ambition was to be more than just another R&B singer. Sam's crossover models were Harry Belafonte, Sammy Davis Jr., and Nat King Cole. Within six months of the start of his pop career, Sam was booked into the Copacabana in New York City, which symbolized mainstream show business success. The Copa, let's face it, that was the place. If you meant to the Copa, man, that was it. The pressure on Sam to succeed at the Copa was tremendous. He and his producer, Bumps Blackwell, struggled to get his act together before the show. The club was packed with a middle-aged white audience who were not impressed with Sam. One of the Copa bombed. <laughs> You bombed? <laughs> Did you really? That's right. I, I didn't you, bomb. You and I, I, you know, I bombed the Copa. Well, see, it's right. I bombed. The Copa's a funny room, and unless you know show business, and unless New you York give City. it a real a adult broom. approach, right. you bomb. And that's because why I did, because I didn't make good. That's why yeah. I said bomb. Huh? Because there are Copas everywhere. It's the one in New York City you're talking about. Which, that's right. For some reason, I can't explain it, it happens to be the prestige date of all time. If you make it at the Copa, that's it. Is that true? Isn't that true? Why do you think you bombed? Why do you? I know why I bombed. Because I wasn't ready. Somebody have mercy and tell me what is wrong with me. After his failure at the Copa, Sam went back to working the Chitlin circuit. His dreams of colorblind success shot down. For the first time in his life, Sam Cooke had failed, and he hated it. Oh, I got a long way to get there, and I got a short time to go. Like every other black artist out on the road, Sam had to face the insults of prejudice on a daily basis. If there was no rooming a boarding house where we as black artists could rest, you had to travel 150 miles before you sleep in the next room, maybe 200, before you find some place to sleep. We had to stay in some cruel, some bad places, you know. I mean, when we sang in places, sometimes we had to... It was always the thing, kept a good watch and a good ring. So you never know when you had the hockey to get out of town. I'm drifting, I'm drifting. You had to deal with all of that. You had to deal with being stopped on the highway. Everybody get out the car, take everything out. Let's see what you got. Then they say, go ahead. Don't be in the town past 2 o'clock. Sam, he didn't back down. You didn't push him. Once he told the police in Memphis, charge him out of gas, and the police come and told Sam to push the car. You over to the side of the street. Sam told him, said, my name is Sam Cook. If you haven't heard of me, your wife know me. He said, now, when you get home tonight, you ask your wife, does she know Sam Cook? He said, I don't push no cars. He said, this is my car. My brother ran out of gas. I'm not pushing. You want to put a ticket on it? Put a ticket on it. I'll pay the fine. He said, but I don't push nobody. Car mine and yours and nobody else. He said, I'm not a pusher. I'm a singer. And he sat back in his car. Police won't left him alone. Charles came up with the gas and they left. In Atlanta, Georgia, Sam headlined a concert that was to be broadcast on the Dick Clark Beach Nut Show. The Ku Klux Klan heard that we were going to mix a black man into a white cast. And they said, uh-uh, no, we're not, not in Atlanta. You're not going to do that. And the Ku Klux Klan sent their people there. I went to Sam and said, this, this could turn out to be ugly. What do you want to do? You want, you want to do this thing? He said, well... I'm going to be out there for two and a half or three minutes. You're going to be there for the full 30 minutes. Are you going to do it? I said, well, I, I don't have any problem. I'll do it. And he said, no, I'll do it. He was, uh, if not the first, he was one of the first that refused to sing to a segregated organ audience. We got to Little Rock. We played in the armory, okay? Military armory. And they said, well... You're going to have to do two shows. And they said, why? I said, because we've got to do a show for the white audience and a show for the black audience. And Sam said, no. We'll do one show for both. The whites would come in and be seated. Then the blacks would come in and they'd be seated. And you had a stage in the middle. And the canine dogs would be going up and down the aisles. And so black people reacted more than whites. When they heard a song that they've been hearing on the radio, oh, man, you thought... They were going to heaven. They'd jump up and scream. Them dogs would uh, to come out and attack. It was weird, man. And the farther south we got, the worse it got. And Sam says, man, I'm telling you, he said, I, 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 I can't do this no more. I wish somebody would come and ease my troubling mind. 
After one show in St. Louis in November of 58, Sam was on his way to Mississippi with his driver, Eddie Cunningham, the guitar player, Cliff White, and Lou Rawls. And it was raining, and we were in Sam's convertible Cadillac. And we came over the hill, and the truck was sitting at him over the highway with no lights or nothing. And Eddie hit the brakes, and the front of the car went down and went up under the back of the car, under the truck, and just kind of cut the top off. And I stayed in the coma five and a half days with a brain concussion. Sam, all he got, he got a little piece of glass in the corner of his eye. Cliff White, the guitar player, had his collarbone broke. Of course, Eddie, he, he left. Sam's driver died in the accident. A few months later, his ex-wife Dolores also died in a car crash. Within certain circles of the gospel community, it was seen almost as a judgment. Sam was shaken. How can there be a cherry that has no stone? And how can there be a chicken that has no bone? How can there be a ring that has no end? Tell me, how can there be a baby with no crying? A cherry when it's blooming. got no stone and a chicken when it's pippin ain't got no bone and I know I know I know a ring that's rolling has no end at all a baby when it's sleeping, there's no crying. A baby when it's sleeping, there's no Sam was no longer satisfied with merely being a recording star. He met with his old friend J.W. Alexander, who had just started a music publishing company. Sam saw the importance of owning his songs. He said, tell me more about this publishing bit. He said, who's in your company? I said, nobody. I said, you ought to have you one. So he said, what about us being partners? I said, all right. I said, yeah. So I said, okay. I shook hands. I said, man, we'll have a great publishing company. You know? And that's how we became partners. No artist back during the day in the 50s had no idea about what publishing mechanicals meant. To us in that time was whether or not you had a Cadillac and a silk suit. To us that was royalties and payment. Once he even told Fats Domino they was in Los Angeles at the Watkins Hotel getting a haircut. And Sam asked Fats, said, Fats, why don't you uh, get your own publishing company? You know what they told Sam? You crazy. That's what they told Sam. Sam said, okay, I'm crazy. He said, but I'm telling you what, I'm crazy enough to keep my own money. As the 1950s ended, Sam was looking for more stability in his life. You're always on my mind. He went back to Chicago and married his childhood sweetheart, Barbara Campbell, who had given birth to Sam's daughter six years before. When I was born, she was 18 and um, he told her that he was going to come back for her. She had to deal with him marrying in between, but it was a very special relationship that they had together. Barbara and Linda moved out to California to be with Sam. Not long after that, Barbara gave birth to Sam's second daughter, Tracy. Now that he had a family to support, he wanted to sign with a major label. Sam wasn't making any money on Keen Records. His manager, Jess Rand, got him a deal with RCA. <laughs> 